Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and today we are going to rank all 33 units available to all three Yellow Turban DLC factions. Now, the Yellow Turban DLC was a pre-order bonus for the base game, and it includes the factions of Huang Shao, Gongdu, and He Yi, which are all playable in the 190 start. All three factions share the same roster of units, which is a bit different from the mandate of Heaven Yellow Turban factions, which we have already ranked in the past. Now, ranking these Yellow Turban units is always a difficult task, as you have to not only consider factors like their stats and their cost, but also stuff like reform requirements and a very confusing system of general class restrictions. So we're going to try to do the best we can in the unit overview portion of the tier list guide to cover all these factors, so let's jump into that right now. Alrighty, so here we are in custom battle, and we have the units largely grouped into three different sections. The only difference here is these units are restricted by general class. These seven units here, which we have grouped into group one, are units that's shared among the three classes. And finally, we have siege weapons, which is currently missing the multi-bolt crossbow, as that is not allowed to be used by yellow turbans during custom battles, which is not a big deal because we have featured the siege weapons many times in multiple tier lists and many other videos. They are very strong, we all know what they're used for, there's really no need to talk about them. I just put this here so you know that they're available to yellow turbans. And aside from the 7 units that's shared among all classes, where the classes are Scholar, represented by Huang Shao here, Veterans represented by Gongdu, and finally healers represented by He Yi. We have units that are exclusive to each class, and they're also represented here by the retinue that they belong in. Now, it's hard to order these. Uh, we'll probably do a mix of unit type ranking and also who's available to what general. If you're curious about which units are available to which class, what skill trees available to which class, what type of army compositions, there is actually detailed character guides for Yellow Turban on the channel already. It's slightly outdated in terms of unit roster, as these base game Yellow Turbans received a few new units when the Mandate of Heaven was launched. But overall, the character class system did not change very much, and that army composition guide for Yellow Turban is still pretty relevant today. So definitely go check those out if you're curious, but for the purpose of this tier list, we'll be just looking at the units per class and moving forward from there. And to kick things off, we'll start over here in the group that's shared among all three classes, and they're the basic units, and they're very flexible. So let's kick things off here all the way in the back with the Peasant Warriors. Now, Peasant Warriors here are expendable, cheap unit. They are one of the cheapest unit in the game for Yellow Turbans. Not the cheapest, as we're going to see Peasant Archers a little bit, being slightly cheaper, but they're actually quite powerful for what they cost. You have a unit that has 84 charge, which is pretty decent, attack speed is a bit slow, and all the damage is on melee base. But 39 melee base damage is not that bad. Previously, I had very poor opinions of the peasant units, but after playing a campaign for Zhang Jiao, which I know is a bit different from the base game Yellow Turbans, as you have ridiculously high replenishment rate. But by having a really high replenishment rate, it really highlights these units where you can just mass in great numbers due to their cheap cost. Yellow Turbans have some of the most powerful generals in the game. So if you could fight where you have three generals with a very decent army that costs average price, or if you could have six generals with full stacks of peasant units, I would make an argument that the peasant army, or two peasant armies, is much better than one higher costing yellow turban army, just because the generals are very very strong, and these peasant units aren't that bad. 39 base damage is pretty decent, and if you ever seen my Zhang Jiao campaign, we pretty much only spammed peasants for early game, for mid game, and we didn't spice things up until we got to late game. And we only did it because we wanted to spice things up, not because the peasants can no longer carry us. 
So these are strong units in my opinion, and they're expendable, so if they route, there's no morale penalties. They do all have the Raider trait. This is very common among a lot of Yellow Turban units, which means they will start lighting things on fire if you have them idle, which is a blessing in some times because you can sneak these guys into towns, light up the whole town, settlement damage is going to kick in for a huge morale debuff on the enemy, and you can take out towers that way. So these are peasant warriors. Then moving on, their stronger counterpart is their yellow turban warriors. Now these guys obviously look a lot stronger, and they're going to be kind of the standard infantry unit for the yellow turban. Decent damage, I would say average or below average, 25, 10, 24 attack speed. If you do the math here, the attack on the peasant warrior, if you disregard the attack speed for one moment, it's actually much better than what you have here. Because even though you do get 10 armor piercing damage, you really should just be adding them together real quick. So 35 versus 39, and then you consider the cost. And obviously you wanna consider how much armor the enemy have. Those four points, when is the break even point? I would argue somewhere around 20% would be eight points away from this unit and 20% for this is five point away. And that difference is only three and the total difference is four. So they would need to have somewhere around 25% armor, which goes beyond what's capable by militia units for a lot of the Han roster. Those are the units you be fighting the most. So until the enemy get higher tier unit, you're gonna do very well with either the peasant warrior or the old turban warriors here. And these guys obviously are much better trained and they're gonna suit you better even in the mid game. Their strong selling point is that they have access to formations. So shield wall is your go-to for these guys and that will push their range block chance to 95%, which is what you really want these guys for. They're really good at blocking arrows. And aside from that, they have decent charge. We talked about their damage already. Their armor stats surprisingly good. And stat-wise, what you're going to find out about Yellow Turbans is that Yellow Turban units have really good stats overall. Like throughout their roster, all the units are pretty heavily statted. Uh, Sometimes you get a punishment to morale or unit size, but that's about it. The actual damage stat and armor stat are all outstanding, and we're going to see that as we move on in our ranking. And then proceeding on, we have a bunch of flags. Let's move it down a little. We have our peasant spearmen. These are the peasant variant of the spear unit, similar to peasant warriors. These are the polearm variation. They obviously get charge reflector for being polearm units. They're expendable once again, still have the raider trait. The attack speed is the huge punishment here. Compared to all peasant unit, they have slower attack speed. That will go up as they rank up, so it's not that bad. Once again, excellent damage. Nigh base, 44 armor piercing. That is really high. For those of you who came from the Naman tier list, you might remember some of those same bamboo sticks on the Naman units just had a really high base damage, like 37. These have Nigh 44 with 44 on armor piercing, so outstanding units compared to other types of unit that you might find. Also. Pretty good armor stats, 17% is not bad given that they're a peasant unit. The typical low tier armor in the game is 7%, so they definitely have advantage there as well. So they serve a purpose for being cheap, expendable, anti-cavalry, poor arm unit with decent damage. And then we have an upgraded version, similar to what we had with the sword units. Here you have the yellow turban spearmen, access to formations which means if they get shield wall here, the spear variant, they can push their range block chance to 70%, pretty good. And you also have access to charge reflector, which is their big selling point. You have decent damage once again. Now, as you can see, both of these units actually don't have super high damage, 13 attack rate, 16 attack rate, 944, 830. So they have less attack than these guys, but that's understandable because you are using one of your hands on a shield, so you're not going to do the maximum damage with the spear that you're holding. Um, but in general, this only helps highlight the point that peasant units are actually all fairly strong and 
fairly underrated for the fact that you can spam a bunch of them without penalizing your morale or even your bankroll here. Then moving on, we have two more units here, starting with the Peasant Archers. So this is the cheapest unit that the Yellow Turbans can utilize, and they're very, very good. Um, they are very similar to Archer Militias, except for they get expendable on top of their stats. Damage obviously is a bit low, attack rate is not that high, ammo is also a bit low, and the range is 180. So the same penalties that you will see on Archer Militia are on these units. So you can kind of see them as the Archer Militia variants for the Old Turban, but they're much cheaper than Archer Militias and they get the expendable trait as well. Then the upgraded version for them is obviously going to be named Yellow Turban Archers. So if you kind of see a trend here, you get a Peasant variant and you get a Yellow Turban variant. And all these are the units that's shared among all the classes. Similar to the Archer upgrade from Archer Militia, the Yellow Turban Archers is a pretty decent upgrade over the Peasant Archers. Obviously the cost will shoot up. The range goes to the standard 200. Damage goes up. Firing rate goes up just a little bit. Ammo goes up quite a bit and these units actually wear a decent amount of armor. So not a bad upgrade. You also don't need any crazy reforms like you would with the Han factions where you need to build a school building. So they're definitely more versatile, whereas this is just dirt cheap. Then you get one cavalry unit that's shared among all the classes. This is the Yellow Turban Horsemen, very consistent with the naming here. They are melee cavalry. But unlike Han Generals, where commanders have access to a nobility skill that can push melee cavalry to 85% range block chance, you're not going to get that with Yellow Turban, so they're going to stay at 65%, but like all melee cavalry, they are going to get the 50% missile resistance. If you combine this, I would say they're definitely not as good as Han units in terms of using them as arrow sponges, and it probably puts them on par with a 95% boost from any sort of spearman unit. Um, if you can, or actually shield wall over here will be 95%, here would be 70%. And if you have other units later on spears, you can get a 95% on a spear as well, which we'll cover a bit later. But they're still pretty decent. The melee charge obviously is a little bit lower. Armor's pretty average. They're not bad for your standard go-to uh, cavalry unit. And one trend I would like to say is that you have the peasant variant, which is almost like the militia, but I would say they have more armor and more damage than typical Han militia. Then you have the standard unit, which is closer to the medium sized unit, and they all get formations, which is really nice, even though you get access to these units much easier than the Han variants. Han variants for the medium units usually require some sort of reform. So it's nice to see that Yellow Turban have access to these much earlier and all on their general classes so you don't have restrictions whereas the medium tier units for Han roster typically have class restrictions already. Whereas over here, these seven units, at least four of them, the Yellow Turban variants, have no class restrictions here. And then speaking of class restrictions, let's move on to the Scholar. We'll go to the Chanters. We'll be zipping around this huge block of unit because I want to go by classes here. It kind of makes more sense in terms of how you plan your armies because you can't recruit these on a veteran or on a healer. So starting with these chanters, um, they are cheap units and they're not very strong by themselves. The purpose of this unit is to boost the stats of other units around them. As you see, they have the encouraged trait, which will boost the morale of units nearby. And most importantly, they have this passive buff. It's a sacred chant. So they will boost all units within 75 meters by 10% damage to their base and armor piercing for melee. So they're not boosting any type of range damage. And those units will also get 10% armor. This is a very good boost in my opinion because we talked about how most yellow turban units are actually overstated for their cost and for their level tier compared to Han units and getting additional buffs from a unit like the Chanter which we only need one as this effect does not stack. So they're great units but only recruit one of them. Don't get them into any type of fighting. They're just there to stand behind and boost your troops. And there are a ton of other boosts you can stack 
with general skills in the yellow turban skill tree. So yellow turban units can get very powerful very quickly if you have the right type of boost from your generals and from units like the Chanter. Then moving on, we have another unit here in the Huanglao Paragons. This is one of my favorite units in the game. They play a very singular role and they do it really, really well. They are your iconic assault troopers. They have two blades in their hand. They have extremely high damage and decent amount of armor. Now, obviously their weakness is they are smaller size. They're half size compared to usual infantry. So you see 60 here, but per unit health is still the same. So the ratio of health is the same. So you see this is a full size unit, 72K, half size unit, 36K. So at least the per unit health is the same. They are really cheap. They cost five more upkeep than the peasant warrior. That's how cheap they are. They're pretty much a peasant level type of cost. And if you look at their stats, 67 base damage, 20 armor piercing on 27 attack rate on level one. So the attack rate will go up as they rank up. Decent amount of charge, that's not really where they shine. They really just have high damage and decent amount of attack speed. For dual wielders, 27 is actually high. Usually dual wielders, like the axe units we've seen before for Namai units, it's usually 24. So very good stat, decent morale, which can be boosted. All their attack can be boosted. They stand next to those chanters and they're gonna get more armor. You see 42 right here with 30 melee evasion, very good. Obviously the weakness in general is the fact that they have no range block chance. You wanna utilize these whether by protecting them from enemy range before you initiate the fight or using some sort of ambush tactic where you can close the gap very easily then charge these guys in. Very, very good unit, just because the damage is ridiculous. That is really, really high damage. I can't emphasize that enough. And then moving on, we have the Yellow Sky Heralds. This is a very weird unit in my opinion. So they are a mace unit, single-handed. They have two very interesting things going for them. One, they're unbreakable, which you can see by the 100 morale. So they will fight till the very last men. But the other thing about them is they're one of the few units in the game that has a trait that's defined as unruly, which means they could go after an enemy nearby without you giving them a order. That might sound okay because they're hunting enemy units, but what this means is you can't command them sometime. They could just go for it. So given their low defensive stat, they have very little armor. It's still not as bad as some militia units from the Han roster, but 70% armor is pretty much the low end of things. And what you have here is basically a unit that's really vulnerable to fighting to the last man, and usually they will fight to the last man because you don't have control over them. And their damage is not too crazy. So 24 attack speed, in my opinion, is actually slow given they have a one-handed weapon with a free hand. And the damage, 11-27. It's heavily skewed towards armor piercing, but compare them to the last unit we've seen, right? Huang Lao Paragon just puts everyone to shame by the amount of damage they can do. So I'm not that impressed with this unit, even though they have some interesting traits. Then moving on, we have a more advanced unit. Here is the Vulnerable Wu. And the Vulnerable Wu are these small unit sized units that have scare and also poison weapons. They use a poison sword and they survive in combat by having really high melee evasion with low armor. So almost like the Pearl Dragon setup, they will still take decent damage, but they rely on lasting a bit longer in melee combat, poisoning the enemy and letting the poison tick do the job. You can kind of see if I can even select onto the unit card, the 56 damage over 15 seconds on poison damage, very standard. They have good charge, decent morale, and they actually have more hit points per unit because remember we looked at this one being 36k at half size this is the same exact size but at 54k which is 75 percent of the health which means they have about 50 percent more health per unit than the regular unit so they're actually kind of tanky and they can survive off of that and they 
mainly try to deal their poison damage to take off the enemy health. They also have 40% range block chance, very very similar to Pearl Dragon again. Low armor unit with high evasion, with some range block chance even though they don't hold a shield. Attack rate's a little slow for my taste. Damage is okay given that they have additional poison damage and good charge. And pretty tanky, also has scare. Not a bad unit. Then we have what supposedly is the most advanced or most expensive melee infantry for the Alturan roster in the Scholar Warriors. They're small unit size once again, but you can look at their health. 48k, it's not as good as what we just seen on the Vulnerable Wool. So not as tanky per unit. They have decently high melee evasion, but also not as high as the Vulnerable Wool. And if you look at the armor stat, that's the only place where they're winning. They're wearing slightly more armor. They have the same 40% range block uh, chance setup. They're dual wielding and they're maintaining the 24 attack speed, so that's good. They have the same exact damage profile as the Huanglao Paragons, but they cost four times as much. So in terms of unit size, you can get four of these for the price of one of these. And that's a pretty telling picture in my mind because if you take it to the extreme, I can have one unit or one army filled with these very strong scholar warriors, or I could have four armies filled with Huanglao Paragons. Which one would you take? And Huanglao Paragons even have more armor than these guys. Sure, there is no range block chance and low melee evasion and slightly less melee charge bonus, but I think the picture is pretty clear which unit I prefer. Uh, we do have to mention they do give Encourage to allies, which will not stack if you have a Chanter. So Encourage is only going to happen once. If you have Encourage on General, that's not going to stack either. Encourage as an effect will only occur once, whichever one has the highest Encourage uh, boost. So that's not really a super special thing about them, and I don't really like these units just because the cost and the value proposition is not that high. Then moving on, we go away from the melee infantry, which seems to be the thing for Scholar class. As you see, five units of their eight are melee infantry, and we go towards a poem unit. So this poem unit here is the Militia of Virtue. They use a gun or a staff. They have very low armor piercing damage because of that, 46 base damage, 20 attack speed. So the damage portion's not too bad. Uh, even though most of it's on base, it's very high, and together it's 49, which is decently um, you know, high. Even if you're fighting someone with, let's say, 50% armor, you're still doing about 26 damage to them, which is probably on par with what a spear guard would be doing. And they have very low charge, which is a little bit disappointing. They have Unbreakable, which is very lovely. And that's um, in addition to having immune to fatigue, which is one point I want to get to. It's kind of weird to give this unit immunity to fatigue. Because usually what you want is a unit that can charge repeatedly, something that uses fatigue quite a bit. The situation here is you have so low charge bonus that I don't know what this is going to bring you. You march for a long time, like you don't actually get much for having this. Unbreakable is kind of cool though. Uh, as they will fight to the end, high evasion, low armor, no range block chance. Not the greatest unit in my opinion. Then moving on, we have Archery Masters. Now these are the most expensive range unit for the Yellow Turban roster. They have the 225 range, which is the maximum amount you can get from a Yellow Turban range unit. They have 50 ammo, 20 attack speed, which is their main selling point. They have very high attack speed. And the damage is pretty good, 4211. It's a little bit less than Onyx Dragons, but since the Dragon units are not available to Yellow Turbans, this is the best that they have. You have 40% range block chance by being very nimble, I guess, similar to all the more high tier units that we have seen so far. No shield, still 40%. So that's not bad if you get into a trade fire situation, even with the Onyx Dragons. By having that extra 40%, it's really going to help you out. And you're mainly recruiting these for the fact that they outrange most standard archers and even the crossbow. The basic crossbow is 220, 225, you're going to edge them out by a little bit. And they have high morale, surprisingly high charge. I don't know why we need 70 charge on these units. Very low melee damage, pretty much non-existent defensive stats. This is 
the only figure that really matters from the defensive side. Uh, not a bad unit, although they are small unit size, so you're only getting 60 of these. So the total damage output is going to be lower than a unit that would be 120. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. Obviously the ammo count make up for that, but we're going to see very soon how much it make up for that. Then we have one of these slightly newer units. I believe the Zadza Raiders were added in when the Mandate of Heaven came out. Previously, Yellow Turbans lacked a lot of cavalry options. Now they have some decent ones, including this one. So this is obviously a yellow cavalry or a melee cavalry, and they specialize in tanking arrows. They don't have the 65%, they only have 60%, but they do have missile resistant, 50% less damage taken from arrows, make them very, very good. This is a pretty amazing unit in my mind. Uh, for a couple reasons. It is small size, so instead of 30 you get 16, which I know is a weird number. They're supposed to be 15, I don't know why they give you one extra on large unit size. They're half unit size, that's the design. So if you're playing on, I forgot what's called, but if you're playing on where the standard size is 160, 40, these guys will be 20. And if you're playing on extreme, I think they're like 32, which would be right, or maybe you get 30. They're supposed to be half, I know that. Maybe because the way they're lined up, it couldn't give you a 15 size, but that's really weird. Regardless of their size, uh, pound for pound, they're very, very good. For a melee cavalry to have 234 charge, that's very high. They have access to all the formation that you need. They are uh, cause scare and they also are immune to scare. And in addition, they have raider, those are similar. Resistance to fatigue is pretty helpful since we talked about units that charge a lot need resistance to fatigue or fatigue immunity preferably. They have decent damage. It's nothing to you know write home about, but it's not bad. Very, very high armor. 63% is the same level you would see on a he heavy cataphract, and they have higher speed than a heavy cataphract. So excellent unit overall. And you have the same bonuses to defense, which we talked about in terms of arrow blocking. Um, very good unit for Yellow Turban Cavalry. Then moving on, we have the Veteran class. They have slightly more polearm and range units. And starting here with the Fervent Defenders. So these guys are your typical Spearmen, anti-cavalry, uh, no shield, which means they are not going to rank very high in my book. Um, they have high damage though, not going to lie. 20 attack speed, 25, 31, that's really not bad. It's just that you're going to see a lot of high damage on a lot of these yellow turban units, which is rather surprising. Uh, stats really come at a premium here. They do have a few formations, uh, the standard ones, Spear Wall and Hollow Square. Nothing too special. Then you have a slightly upgraded version of them, Defender of the Land. And they have very, very similar setup, except for these guys have more armor. And they cost more. That's kind of uh, the trade-off here. Uh, nothing too different with the skill or the formation either. Damage, I believe, is a little bit higher. Nope, same exact damage. 25, 31, 20 attack speed. It's just the armor and melee evasion. So they're just sturdier versions of the Fervent Defender. And then we move into something that's more familiar for those of us who played Han Factions first. Reclaimers. They're basically... Yellow Turban Spear Guards, except they're only available on Veteran Class, and they have pretty much the same exact stats as Spear Guards. Damage that's skewed heavily towards Armor Piercing, low attack speed, average morale, almost no charge bonus, you have your shield that gives 60%. The only thing that's different, and this is actually important, is they don't have access to Turtle Formation, which I'm going to hold against them. Because it's not like turtles not available to yellow turbans. We'll see that it is. But this is one of the few units with the big shields that can't do turtle. And that's going to make them a lot worse than spear guards. Because you can't use them to safely take towers or to tank towers when you do a siege. Then we move on to some of the range units here. Uh, starting with men of the forest. And if you just look at them, they use an axe and a bow. So they're a dual weapon unit. But their blue unit, so the bow is their main component. If you look at their bow stat, decent firing rate. 16 is actually pretty high. 200 range, not bad. 31 ammo, not bad. 28, 17, also not bad. So their bow component is pretty good. And if you look at their melee component, it's also not too bad either. 30 attack rate, pretty high. 
722 compared to all the yellow turbo units, a bit low. But because you are using an axe, you do get the shield breaker bonus. And you have this terrain bonus where you can have no penalties on all terrain. Their skirmish units hiding during ambushes, take a couple arrows out, then charge in with your axe. Not a bad unit. Then moving on, we have Lance Chosen. Now this unit here is the archery unit that I'm going to recommend for most of you guys because, well, most people tend to gravitate towards archery master since it is kind of put as the best unit for range. The Land Chosen is actually a great uh, replacement unit for that because if you look at the damage component, the range component, and the ammo component, it's very similar. Less ammo, of course. The one thing that's bad about this unit is it fires a lot slower than Archery Masters. Archery Masters firing rate is 20. These guys have 11. That's going to hurt you in terms of enemy charging at you. You only have a set amount of time to deal your range damage out before the lines collide and your range units can really no longer deal any more damage. That's going to hurt you. But if you're fighting in a siege, these units are going to do just fine because you got all day to shoot at the enemy behind walls and that's where they are going to shine a bit more because you get 120 of them versus the 60 here at a much cheaper cost. So if you total up the arrow count, these guys at the same exact damage are only going to do about 20, 25 set of arrow damage if you get what I mean because the half size whereas these get 40 so you're doing much more total damage with these units and in addition these guys have decent melee stat as well so you're looking at a 30 attack speed 25 11 versus 20 attack speed 9 and 3 so archery master pretty much is non-existent as a unit that gets attacked whereas the lance chosen with double size and better stats in terms of their melee capabilities will do fine in those long battles where you use up all your ammo. Maybe it's a multiple army battle and you're fighting reinforcements and you can look at their armor too. They're just going to be slightly better in melee and match them in range. So make these guys also cheaper, a much better replacement compared to the archery master. Then we have this unit right here. Watchmen of the Peace. This is the only crossbow unit available to the Yellow Turban. So that by itself makes them slightly special because you have the high armor piercing damage uh, at 48 with 20 base, very high overall damage. They have a giant shield on their back which protects them when they reload. 60% range block chance on that. Obviously the slower firing rate on all crossbow units doesn't matter what faction you are. So it's not that punishing. 220 range, not terrible. 20 ammo hurts a little bit but also not out of the realm of what's available to crossbow units and the fact that they have a shield makes them a lot better than the generic crossbow units that's available on the Han roster. And once again, they do decently well in melee. 30 attack rate, 25 11 with decent armor, decent evasion and extra stat because they also have a shield once they go into melee. So not a bad unit. And finally, we have our only ranged um, cavalry unit in the Horseback Huntsman. And these guys have one specialty. They're cheap. They're actually very cheap in the game. They cost about the same as one of these Yellow Turban Spearmen, which speak a lot about how cheap they are. And you should definitely try to utilize a few of them and expand your battle strategies by having some harassment unit. They're completely worthless as cavalry. So... Even though they're cheap, they're not really going to function at all like a cavalry. Look at their charge bonus. 38. Like, what is going on with these horses? Like, if you're riding donkeys out there, they should do more charge than 38. But it's terrible. Your melee component is terrible. But your range component is really, really good. 22 attack speed on the range. Very nice. 44 damage on base, 25 on armor piercing. It's actually a super good distribution. If you look at the distribution here on the Archery Master, 42 11 versus this, 44 25. They're better. You don't have as much range, but because you're so mobile, you can loop around and find melee targets to hit. You're not trading fire with something that can hit you back. So 200 is fine. Very high ammo. Now, of course, the ammo figure you have to kind of discount because you only have 30 unit. 
So your overall damage is not as high. It's not like we're going to be recruiting these units to replace our standard archers because they're so small. They're one fourth size. So technically the total damage you can get out of these units is only about a fourth of those 53 ammo. So you're looking at something like 13 ammo uh, set of damage to compare it with something like the Lance Chosen. But even at 13, if you do the math there, you can convert these as well. They're only 25 and they do lower damage. So with that fast attack speed, you can pull out certain units away from enemy formations by running around them. And that makes these quite useful. And they have access to fire arrows as well. Pretty good units, uh, especially at their price. Then moving forward to another cavalry unit, here we have the Virtuous Nobleman. This is one of those units that use an axe on horseback, which makes them actually super interesting as they almost become a counter to other melee cavalry because the axe will have shield breaker. And if you chase them into other melee cavalry, you break the shield, reduce their stats here, which is actually a pretty big portion of their stat. Now, obviously they're still going to be super weak to shot cavalry, which usually do not use a shield. And they actually use some sort of poem weapon and poem does extra against cavalry and you're still cavalry here. And um, that's going to hurt you, but you specialize in something. You hurt other melee cavalries. And in terms of their stat, it's once again very high. Uh, charge is not that high, but very high armor, still very fast speed, 60% range block chance. You're still a melee cavalry, so you still get this 50%. You have access to the standard formations, you're immune to scare, and you're also immune to fatigue. This is very good because now you can loop around. Now, obviously, if you combine this with a higher melee charge bonus, it would be better. But even at this rate, you're never going to get tired, therefore your charge will never fall short. As some of those higher charge units, once they get fatigued, their charge pretty much become non-existent. These guys will consistently stay at 154, so I would still say this unit is pretty good. It's one of the few yellow turban units where the immune to fatigue is actually useful. Then moving on, we have healer units. We'll start with one of these range units. Now the Bringers of Righteousness is a very weird unit that I feel like it's miscolored. It's blue, so you would think the range component is their main thing. But if you look at the range component, 6 range attack rate? Like who trained these guys? 25-16, that's pretty much an archer damage. 200 range, 24. So honestly here, they are a slower archer. Nothing to write home about at all. But if you look at their melee component, outstanding. Or a polearm unit, or they're not classified as polearm, let's just say that, they use a glaive. We have 84 charge, not bad. 24 attack rate, not bad for a two-handed weapon. 39 base, 20 armor piercing, those are all good numbers. But the problem here is they're colored as blue, therefore they don't have charge reflect against large or against mounted, which makes them pretty much useless. So. They're not good at what their primary color is and where they kind of excel, they don't have the main thing that you want from a polearm unit that is shieldless, which is anti-cavalry. So they're out round, like all-rounders who doesn't do good in any of their all-rounder areas, making them a pretty awkward unit to use. Then we move on to an excellent unit, Stuart Shields. This is also a unit that was added in during the Mandate of Heaven, and this unit is excellent. This is the unit with the turtle formation giant shield that is at 80% without any formations. That is the highest I have seen in game, and it combos very well with shield wall, which gives you 15% for spear shield wall, and that puts them at 95. This is the first time we've seen a unit that's polearm with 95, because we've seen a lot of shield walls with swords at 95. And that makes them special because if you want them to tank enemy arrows, then that will be the formation you set them in. And they'll be really good at doing that because they have actually decent high armor. You have to add both of these together because they will have their shield. So 55% armor to absorb a bunch of arrows and 95%. Pretty much similar to what you would get out of your melee cavalry as yellow turban. Because remember, melee cavalry is 65% for yellow turbans, doesn't get the extra 20%. So even though they have the 50% less damage, they're probably not going to tank it up as well as the store shields. And they have access to turtle, 
which means when you don't want to take arrow damage or you want to absorb arrow tower damage, you can switch over to this formation, which protects you from any range damage. The attack figure is still very similar to spear guards, uh, not very high, but the main purpose is to hold the line and they have high morale to do that. And if you need a very wide line where you can't use any formation because one of the downfalls of shield wall is you cramp up together therefore you can't cover as much horizontal space to protect your front line they are excellent without formations you just stretch them as far as you can where they are 80 percent still a lot better than 55 or 60 which you see on spear guards and heavy spear guards very very good unit then we have a tiny unit so this is an infantry at one-fourth size, that's pretty unusual, and they are the arm of the supreme peace. They hold a big mace that has splash damage. You can almost think of them as the precursors to follow the flame, except for these maces are not lit up on fire. They have slower attack rate than follow the flame, so the typical splash damage attack rate is 15, you see this on this unit, also Jianma Jian. Damage is extremely high though, 76 base. 31 armor piercing. That is pretty ridiculous. If you add the fact that they have splash damage as well, they have decent melee evasion, decent armor, very good charge, I would argue. 147 is pretty good. 54 morale. So all the stats are quite nice and uh, they are immune to scare, which I don't think matters that much when you have this high of morale. And the thing about these unit is, other than the fact that they're a small unit size, they're just outstanding. And obviously, having no range block chance is going to hurt them. Having only a quarter size is going to hurt them. You're going to have to find a situation, maybe in an ambush, where you just charge them out, let them move into an enemy clump, and let them go to town. Um, good unit, but you just got to find the situation for them. Then moving on, we have the Righteous Vanguard, which is a terrible unit. Let me just start things off right there. They are the most expensive unit available to Yellow Turbans. They cost more than Tribuchets, and they are a shock cavalry unit, they're red cavalry. They have shields, so you would think they're comparable to, let's say, um, Jade Dragons or Tiger and Leopard cavalry. Sure, they have a lot less charge than those units, 218, which if you remember from some of the melee shock, or melee cavalry, they're not even shock, melee cavalries, melee cavalry have higher charge than them, which is kind of mind-blowing. They have no extra stats, so no fatigue immunity that you would see on Virtuous Nobleman, no fatigue resistance, which you see on Zazza Raiders. They do have standard unit size, so maybe that's the thing that's going for them. But even then, the charge is terrible, and the armor is high, but they're slow. Whereas the armor is high, fast, armor is higher, fast, slow. 60% range block chance plus 50% armor or missile resistance, 45% range block chance with lower charge. Like, which way would you go here? But you could argue they use a spear, so they kill other cavalries faster. But we have this unit right here, the White Wave Horseman. The White Wave Horseman also uses a spear, also has a shield, higher charge than what we just seen, cheaper. And if you notice here, somehow, as a shot cavalry, they have missile resistance. I don't know if this is a mistake, but if it's a mistake, it's a very good one. Because now we have a shot cavalry with 45% range block chance and 50% missile resistance using a pole arm that's good against other cavalry with high charge. Well, relatively speaking to what we just seen. And in addition to all of that, you also have discipline, you also have grail deployment, whereas this unit has nothing. So White Wave Horseman, definitely way better than Righteous Vanguard, and at a much cheaper price. So that's the comparison there. Also faster. So what else what else does this have better than that? Just completely outclass this Righteous Vanguard. Then moving on, we have Yoxia. Now this is a melee infantry. Uh, they carry a shield, they have a sword. They're designed to be these well-trained units, 60, per, uh, 60 uh, unit, so half size. They are unbreakable. They have a lot of really good traits. I think they're the typical above average unit, good at everything. Uh, grail deployment, immune to scare, unbreakable, formations that you would need for a sword unit. 
63% armor, 10% extra armor from shield, very high evasion, evasion from shield, decent damage distribution, decent charge, unbreakable, 55% range block chance, a little bit slow, half unit. You can't really find anything bad about these units, they're not even the most expensive melee unit, so I would just say they're just good at everything, doesn't stand out anywhere in particular, but above average in everything. And they're also not the only unbreakable unit, so they don't even stand out there. And they're cheaper than Vulnerable Wu, so that's another thing going for them. Then we have People's Warband. So People's Warband is pretty interesting. I want to say they are the clone of Huang Lao's Paragon. Uh, they have slightly less damage. So Huang Lao's Paragon here, 60 unit size, 67 attack, base, 20 armor piercing. Here we see they are 55, 16, so a little bit lower everywhere. Slightly faster attack speed to make up for that. Same weapon almost, and almost identical charge, a little bit higher morale, less armor, and less evasion. But what these guys have is they have regular size. So technically, you're getting twice as many unit, and they cost exactly twice as much as Huang Lao Paragon. So that's why I think they're kind of like a clone unit. So the math you're doing here is if you could afford two armies of that, or even let's say we can afford four armies of all Huang Lao Paragons, which is a very viable army composition, by the way. You can overwhelm any army with four full armies of Huang Lao Paragons. They're that good. You can afford two armies of them, and they would be on the battlefield at the same time because the number of unit that's limited on the battlefield is 42 or two full stacks. So technically, you would be better off with this army because you have all your men on the field at the same time. And that's a very unique comparison. And the basis of all that comparison is actually based on this unit, the Scholar Warrior, the other unit that uses two swords uh, that costs four times as much. So you can see this is 1x, 2x, 4x, but 4x have the same unit size as 1x, which makes them terrible. These guys at least have the double unit size going for them for justifying the 2x, and they have slightly less damage to kind of go against that. So technically, I would still prefer these guys because I don't know if I'm going to be running four armies of them, but uh, it's still, it feels a little better. And they have better defense. So stat-wise, these units are better than them. They win just by sheer number. Then finally, we have the White Wave Veterans, our last infantry unit here. Um, they have decent charge, decent morale, pretty good attack rate, decent damage, uh, pretty average overall. So I feel like this unit and the Yosa unit kind of fit the same role. Now, obviously, these guys don't have Unbreakable, their standard unit size. You have a lot of melee infantries with shield. Like, if you compare these two units, this is where things fall apart for White Wave Veterans. So White Wave Veterans, if you look at it, you have 44, 126, 30, 25, 11. Look at this unit. Not too different. Now, obviously, less stats uh, across the board in terms of morale and charge and attack speed. But damage is the same. Armor is the same. Shield is the same. Formation is the same. And these guys cost a lot more than these guys. And on top of the fact that they cost a lot more, you can only recruit them on healers, which might backfire in a lot of situations because you might not have the general for it or you might not want to use that slot on them because of better units in that group. For example, for my healers, I might just want a lot of store shields and they satisfy all the need I have as anti-range, then I don't need this unit at all. So there's a lot of things going against them in that aspect. And finally, we have siege weapons. I don't think we need to talk about them. They're automatically S tier and you know the reasons why. So let's move on, uh, go back to the tier list and actually rank all these units. Alrighty, so after seeing all 33 units, we're gonna be ranking all of them now. Uh, before we do that, please remember that this tier list is only a reflection of my personal opinions based on my experience playing single player romance campaigns on legendary difficulty. And all the figures and stats that we just seen are on large unit size on patch 1.6.1, so if you happen to be watching in the future or play on a different unit size, please adjust accordingly. 
So let's now start ranking these starting from the units that shared among all the classes with the peasant warrior right here. Now these units are cheap, they are expendable, they have decent attack damage, and they're surprisingly good given how strong yellow turban generals are. They're very suitable for the campaign, so they're going to get a B rank from me. And then moving on to their slightly better counterpart, the yellow turban warriors. They have formations, which is often rare for one of these more beginner units that's available to all classes, and that's going to give them an edge. They still have decent attack, and their main selling point is that you can get 95% range block chance from them, and given the fact that melee cavalrys can't get the 85% plus 50% resistance, 95% on infantry unit is pretty decent. So they're going to step it up to the A tier. They're still still a relatively cheap unit, so that adds some value to them. Then we have the Peasant Spearmen. These are once again cheap, expendable, same story. You want to put these guys on your flank. They counter cavalry just like every other Spearmen in the game, except for they are a ton cheaper. So that makes them very useful, and they're going to be B tier for us. Then moving on to their slightly upgraded variant, their Yellow Turban Spearmen. Once again, they have formations. They don't have turtle, but I'm not going to hold that against them because they use a circular shield. And even the one that use a big shield in the Reclaimer, they also don't have turtle. So the fact that there is no class restrictions on these and you get these right away, they're going to be your go-to frontline, your go-to anti-cavalry for the majority of your game. And if you put them in their spear shield wall, it gives them 70% anti-range. Very, very good. They're actually going to go S tier for me just because they're more versatile than what you have with the Yellow Turban Warriors, given that they can counter cavalry as well. Then we have Peasant Archers. These are your typical archer militias, 180 range, expendable. So much like their other peasant counterparts, they're also going into the B tier as well. So all three peasant units, given their cheap price and expendable tag, are going to be B rank for us. Then the slightly improved version of the Yellow Turban Archers are going to pick up the A tier. They're not as good uh, to go into S, but they're better than them, so they're going to fit into the A tier here. And finally, we have our last unit who's available to all classes, the Yellow Turban Horsemen. Decent speed on these guys, decent charge for melee cavalry, anti-range properties similar to most other melee cavalry, and before you get any sort of reforms or have the right class for other cavalry options, they're going to do just fine as your only cavalry choice. They will help you run down some routed enemies, so they're going to go to the A tier as well. Now obviously these seven units all have their ranking skewed a little bit higher than some of the other units, mainly because they have no class restrictions and they are cheap and available from the beginning. Then moving on, we have the Chanter unit. Now we talked about these guys by themselves, there is nothing special about them, but they will passively boost all your units by 10% melee damage in both base and armor piercing, 10% additional armor, and also improved morale, which makes them outstanding. You really can't ask for more. So this unit, given that you only have to recruit one of them, and they're relatively cheap, is actually going to be S tier for us, because I believe every army should have one of these units and they're going to help your performance overall. Then we have the Yellow Sky Herald. This is a very difficult unit to rank because stat-wise they're not bad. They have pretty much average stats everywhere, average damage, average morale, average charge. They're also unbreakable, which I believe has some value in itself. It's a very difficult unit for enemy to move through. They can hold the position very, very well. They have unruly though, so sometimes they go out of control. So you can expect these units to almost always die off, and they're not expensive. So if you factor all of those things together, I think you can make an argument for A or B. But given the fact that they have unruly, and I really don't like to have units where I can't have a say in what they do, I'm going to favor them towards B. Then we have the Huanglao Paragon. This is no doubt one of my favorite unit here in the Yellow Turban, and I believe one of the strongest unit in terms of value and in terms of just the raw damage they bring with excellent defensive factors as melee evasion and armor as well. So they're going to automatically catapult into the S tier, 
they cost five more upkeep than peasant warriors. Um, by that figure, the base value is about 80. Uh, recruitment cost is, I think, close to 200 something. Super cheap. Dirt cheap. Very, very strong. They do require a bit farther in terms of the reform tree, but once you unlock these, you can just spam armies of these guys and they're going to do great for you. Then moving on, we have the Vulnerable Wu. This is a very pricey unit for the Yellow Turban faction. They have a lot of different traits. They have poison. They have very high melee evasion, 65%, I believe. They're very similar to a Pearl Dragon. They have 40% range block chance. They have a small unit size as well, so only a 60. And given their price, I think they're going to drop a few tiers, even though they do have a more specialty role in the army. I wouldn't even give these guys A tier because they once again lack um, a defined role in the army. Like, what would I need these guys for in my army? Like, poison wouldn't be my go-to rationale to recruit them. They are melee poison troops, so they have to trade casualty back to do damage. I could just recruit Huanglao Paragons for these. I can get two and a half unit of these for every one of these, and they have the same unit size, so they don't even outperform in that aspect. So given all that, they're not going to drop too far. They'll stay at B. Then we have a unit that many people think is very, very great. But honestly, Scholar Warriors is terrible. We explained it in the unit overview. They require a certain reform to unlock, a pretty deep reform. They have the same exact damage profile as the Huanglao Paragons. They have the same exact unit size as the Huanglao Paragons. They cost four times as much to get something such as Encourage and 40% range block chance. That's simply not worth it in my book, especially since you can get Encourage just by having a Chanter unit in the army. So they're not even serving to you well there. You can simply overwhelm enemies with these guys. And if you talk about class restrictions, they're restricted by the same class. So there is nowhere where I think this unit wins. And therefore, I'm going to drop them all the way to D tier. Uh, they cost the same as a trebuchet. Why go for that when you can go for a bunch of these units? Then moving on, we have the Militia of Virtue. These are the unit that use the Gun, so no tips on those staffs, and therefore they are largely melee base damage. They are, however, unbreakable and fatigue immune, but they have really, really low melee charge, which makes it really awkward to use the fatigue immunity because you really can't utilize that extra, you know, vitality, you know, no fatigue for anything. They also don't have a shield, so I don't actually know how to effectively use these units. I almost want to drop them to C, but simply because they're unbreakable, similar to what we did with the Yellow Sky Heralds, they can hold the position really well. Enemies have to kill every single one of them to get past them. So in that aspect, they do have a role, and I'm going to put them as a B-tier unit. Then moving on, we have the Archery Master. Once again, one of these high-end elite units that cost a bunch. Now, they are still very good. Uh, we talked about how one other archer unit can replace their role, but they are actually on two different class restrictions. So perhaps you want your scholar to field your archers, and this is going to be the best archer that you have available in the scholar class by a long shot. Whereas the other unit, the lands chosen, which I think is a slightly better value than these units, are going to be restricted to veteran class. So I'm not going to way too much against them for having a better counterpart because the counterpart is available in a different class whereas Huanglao Paragons and Scholar Warriors are direct matchup in the same class so they're still going to get an A tier uh, they're not going to go S just because they exist but they're pretty close to it I would go with these guys anytime it costs me slightly more money compared to what you get here they cost I think close to 70 or 80 percent more than them so it is actually quite a big difference. Uh, they do fire twice as fast. So if you're thinking about the gap closing time to shoot as much damage as you can, these guys will do better. But overall damage output, because they're half size, is not going to be as high as these guys. Then we have the Dads of Raiders. They have half size, but they have super high charge for melee cavalry. They have the same anti-range component of melee cavalry. They have really high speed, extremely high armor. 
So when you add all those together, I think they're going to be the S tier unit for the yellow turban, who doesn't have that many cavalry options available to them. Then we have fervent defenders. So this is once again one of those awkward units where they are a shieldless spear unit with high damage. But I am a player who don't charge melee infantries into melee combat very often. I feel like that high casualty is not worth it. And even if I'm looking for a high damage unit to do that, my go-to option would be Huanglao Paragons. It wouldn't be Fervent Defenders, which is twice as much as this unit and does a lot less damage. So all of that factor added together means this unit is going to drop to D tier because if I want anti cavalrys on the flank that's vulnerable to enemy uh, range damage, I would just go with a Peasant Spearman who has very good armor piercing damage profile and has the same exact charge reflection you would get on this more expensive unit. And then same thing to the Guardian of the Land. So this unit is the more expensive version, better armor version of the Fervent Defenders and has the same exact pitfalls as that unit. So they're also going to come into the D tier. Then finally, we have Reclaimers. So Reclaimers is quite awkward. Usually if we have a Spear Guard unit, it will rank quite high. But in this case, it's a Spear Guard unit that has a better replacement option that doesn't have turtle. So if you don't have turtle, what you become is a worse version of this unit right here, the yellow turban spearman. That's why the yellow turban spearman is S tier. Because think about it, this unit has 60% range block chance, better damage profile than what you have on the spear guard who has 55% range block chance, they have the same exact formations. They can go to 95%. They can go to 70%. They can, oh, they both have 55%. My mistake there. They both go to 70% range block chance. And they both don't have turtle. They have better damage. They're available on all classes. They are cheaper. They don't require reforms. So where exactly does this unit really belong? Like in all situations where you would default to a spear guard, or in this case, a reformer, you just go with yellow turban spearmen and they will do exactly the same job. And if you want a turtle formation, you will wait till you get store shield. So because of all that factor, surprisingly, this unit is going to be D tier for us as well, because if they exist, they have almost no value here. And then moving on, we have Man of the Forest. This is also a very unique unit. It is a bow and axe unit combo. It does have slightly low morale that's weighing against it. Damage is also not that high. It's made up for the fact that they use an axe, so there's shield breaker component to that. They have decent firing rate for their bow, and their bow damage is pretty good. So as a bow unit, they're not that bad. But price-wise, they're also a little bit expensive. They cost three times as much as the typical peasant archers, and two times as much as the yellow turban archers. So that's going to weigh against them a little bit. And in the end, because of the mixed capabilities, I think they're going to go C tier. And they're going to just nest right there as we talk about the next range unit, the Lands Chosen. So the Lands Chosen, we talked about plenty enough in the overview. They are slower firing archery masters with the same exact damage, same exact range. And they have better total damage output because they have double unit size or standard unit size, whereas the archery master have half unit size. They're also outstanding in melee, especially if you compare it to the pitiful melee stat of archery masters, which makes them a lot more versatile. So in this aspect, they're going to get the S tier for the archery unit here for the yellow turbans. And then moving on, we have Watchmen of the Peace, which isn't too shabby either. This is the big shield crossbow unit that you have in game, and they have 60% range block chance, decent melee once again, and very high armor piercing range damage, and the only crossbow unit in the Yellow Turban roster. So if you're looking for a range unit with high armor piercing, they're going to be your go-to option. Their range is a little bit less than the Lance Chosen and Archery Master. Their firing rate is pitifully low because they are a crossbow unit and their ammo also a bit low. So they're not going to get into S tier, but they will get into A tier here. Uh, still a very good range option for Yellow Turban armies. Then we have the Horseback Huntsman, which we talked about. Very cheap unit, not a cavalry unit, 
so low in terms of the melee charge, not even worth talking about. 38 is a joke. I don't know what they're writing into the battlefield, but they do have a bunch of good stats for their range component. Great archers, very fast firing rate, a lot of ammo, very good damage, and they're cheap. So that all added together is actually going to put them into S tier because they can be a very good mobile harassment unit. You don't want to field a lot of these, but one or two in an army just to round about the enemy formation, pull a couple units out, pick on some easy picking for spear units without shield, they'll do just fine in that role. And then you have the Virtuous Nobleman. This is one of the few axe-wielding units on horseback, quite unique. Their main selling point is they're immune to fatigue. And any unit that's immune to fatigue gets an S tier in my book because you can loop the enemy around the map forever and you can maintain your charge, you can maintain your damage while they get tired. So they're going to get into S tier and they have the added bonus of using the axe on horseback which is good against other melee cavalries and they are melee cavalry themselves so they're good against range as well. So they're going to get into S tier. Then we have the Bringers of Righteousness. This is the really weird unit that's blue, that has a glaive, has decent melee stats, but no anti-cavalry component, no charge reflector. But their bow component is very slow firing rate on a bow with average damage and 200 range. So they're this all-rounder unit that is not exactly good in any of their all-rounder fields. So all in all, they're going to go down to C tier. They're not trash because they still have a value in your army by being this kind of mixed unit. And if you use them in ambush, very similar to the uh, huntsmen here, the mana force, they're not huntsmen here. You can utilize them in kind of a pre-ambush skirmish and then charge them into melee. They will do decently well in melee. They just don't have anti-cavalry, which means you don't want them defensively, but offensively they will do just fine. And then we have store shields. These are your 80% range block chance unit with the spear wall for, or shield wall for the spear units that adds another 15%. So it puts them at 95. They have access to turtle, higher morale, same exact damage. I'll put a spear guards. They're excellent. Automatically going to slot into the S tier here for the yellow turban. And then we have the arm of the supreme peace. Another very unique unit being their quarter size infantries, high damage, splash damage high charge, not very strong defensively, obviously. So there is a weakness here. They're not going to go into the S tier. They're going to go into the A tier here. You can find a pretty good use for them in ambush battles, or if you can protect them to get them to the enemy forces, they will wreck in melee, but they can get easily wiped if you march them through the open field as enemy archers can focus them down quite easily. Then moving on, we have the white wave horsemen. This is a shock cavalry unit, but the only shock cavalry unit that have the missile resistance, which I feel like is a mistake by the developers. Someone probably saw that they had a shield and gave them the missile resistance, even though they are a spear in shield. And because they're that unique in this aspect and the fact they're the cheaper of the two shock cavalry that the yellow turban have. So yellow turban only have two cavalry, two shock cavalry, and they're the cheaper one with the extra missile resistance and the 45% shield and the higher charge, they're going to go S tier here. And by comparison, the Righteous Vanguards, the super expensive unit, more expensive than Siege Weapon unit, lower charge than even the Melee Cavalry, the Dads of Raiders, are going to drop all the way to D tier because I have no reason to ever recruit them. They don't function well even in a Shock Cavalry role because you have another shot cavalry that does better and they don't function well for you know shield blocking or any type of size bonus this is just complete L performance and way too expensive so they're going to go D tier and then finally we have Yosha. Yosha is a very awkward unit to rank because I can't say anything bad about them they have unbreakable they're small unit size but so are a lot of the yellow turban units I mean we put a quarter unit size unit here in A they also have decent or above average attack, above average stats in terms of armor, in terms of range block chance, in terms of evasion. So all in all, they're going to go A tier. 
They don't have a clear defined rule, so I can't really put them in S. They're also not the most expensive, but also not the most cheap unit. They're kind of in this above average range for everything. So I think A tier probably fits them pretty well. And then we have People's Warband. This is what I like to call the Huang Lao Paragon clone. And they're not as high damage as them. And I still prefer them a bit more. Now, obviously, they go on different classes. So they are scholar class. This is healer class. So there is some difference there. And because of that, I think they're equally going to be an S. Because if they can be an S, they can be an S. You get twice the number of men, slightly smaller attack and slightly weaker armor, but twice the number for twice the cost, which I still feel like is a good figure. And in case you're running more healers, which are, in my opinion, stronger generals than scholars using yellow turbans. So you probably find a better use for the generals that are commanding these units. Uh, they're going to be excellent. So they function very similar roles here. They're both very cheap. Same ratio for the same number of men. We mentioned that many times. And then finally, we have the white wave veterans, which unfortunately, unlike the wife wave um, cavalry unit there's a wife wave horseman who is very special they are not that special we did a stat comparison at the end to the regular yellow turban warriors they don't really win out anywhere and they are much more expensive and they're class restricted so why would you ever go for these so because of those reasons they're also going to drop into the d tier and finally we have our siege weapons you know my preferences i think trebuchet automatically s you can make an argument that this does the same thing and it should be S, but in my opinion is if you have the choice between the two, same cost, in almost 99% of situations, this outperforms. So why go for this? So in my book, they drop to D tier because I'm never going to pay for one of these. I will just pay for one of these. So this is our final ranking for the Yellow Turban units. Hopefully you guys enjoy this one and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.